We've been spending a fair amount of time in Isaiah, and this passage from Isaiah 42 is, is powerful. I'm wondering, are there any uh, Downton Abbey fans in the room? Anybody? Yeah, so my, my family hooked me into it. It's not very manly, I suppose, but anyway, it's, uh, I got kind of hooked into that world of Downton Abbey. And uh, so I want to use two illustrations on this to say, so where do you get your image of what it means to be a servant? If you watched a lot, a lot of Downton Abbey, that's a huge theme in the whole thing. It really is a story of the lives of the Lord of the Manor, royalty and his family, and the servants who lived in the home and were engaged in their life together, the interaction of those two groups. And so you might, our images of servant, if we say if you, if you were a servant, um, and, and you have Downton Abbey on the mind, you might think of a butler or a footman or a, a cook or a chambermaid or a housekeeper or something like that, you know, a, a chauffeur. And so all of those roles were present in that TV show on Downton Abbey. And it was interesting because how, they would never, you cannot dare to disagree with really or contradict or be in rebellion to your master. You'd be cut loose uh, immediately you would be uh, terminated and so the, they, they played with that because in the course of the show it's set around World War I and then goes through the kind of the roaring 20s and hits the depression and so forth and so there's financial things and and uh, war going on and the culture is changing and so there's the rise of trade unions uh, the chauffeur actually marries one of the daughters royal daughters um, and so it's convoluted in a changing time, what does it mean to be a servant? And so for some of those in the, in the group of servants of the house, they couldn't imagine really any other life. The butler, Carson, his entire life is wrapped up with Lady Mary and with serving this home. Um, for the, even like the cook, is, she's just so wrapped up in serving and pleasing the family. So for some of you, that Downton Abbey illustration might give some insight to what does it mean when we talk about being a servant. Uh, for some of the rest of you, you're sitting there bored out of your skull going, could you talk about something relevant? Well, how about Despicable Me? So if you've seen that show, that might give us the information on another way of looking at servants, and that would be to be a minion, right? If you were one of the little yellow dudes, Dave is my favorite, and so uh, you go around those little guys with the goggles and they look like yellow pills and they're just running around with funny voices and they are at the beck and call, they are minions to Gru. And uh, there's hundreds of them, if not more, they got their own movie even, but they essentially do not exist in many ways, you could argue, don't exist outside of their master. Uh, he created them, he made them, and they serve him. And so for many of us, the idea of what it means to be a servant could be something like a, fun a flunky or a patsy, someone who has no control over their own life, someone who is a doormat or a gopher or a minion, those kinds of ideas. But this is a powerful message in the scriptures because this word can not only be translated servant, it could be translated slave under absolute submission to the master and this is the servant of the Lord in the book of Isaiah there are four of these I get excited telling you this I'm a Bible geek I get it I'm a church geek and forgive me for a minute but when you if you're a student of the scriptures and in the Old Testament studying the four servant songs of Isaiah is some of the most rich is some of the richest experiences that you can have in the Old Testament because as Christians, we read them and we simply see the footprints, the breath, the touch, the fingerprints of Jesus Christ all over it. There are four of these. And the most magnificent of them is the suffering servant. You're familiar with it. Many of you are familiar with it. Even if you don't know where it is, Isaiah 53, you hear it every Good Friday. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a a tender shoot out of dry land. There was nothing in his appearance that would attract us to him. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. did not open his mouth. All of us have gone astray, right? By his stripes we are healed. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. The suffering servant, Christ on the cross. 
And those powerful words ring with us. But this is the first servant song. And so people have asked over the years, who is the servant? The Christians read it and we go, well, it's Jesus. But in the moment of the Jews, the Jews today, even yet, Jewish people today who are practicing their faith believe that those four servant songs, the servant of the Lord is the nation of Israel. That God called the nation of Israel to be his servant and to give a light to the Gentiles, to bear witness to the world. And to be honest, that is a fair interpretation of that passage. Christians today, we should read that even as it applies to the church, to us who make up the church. That we also, isn't it appropriate to say, that we also should be considered the servant of the Lord. To, ironically, in Isaiah's day, most Bible students and scholars, I'm included in that group, student anyway, that says that the, the servant of the Lord here is in fact fulfilled very specifically in history by a non-Jewish non-believer, Cyrus. King Cyrus of Persia, when the Jews are scattered all around the world, they're in exile, the nation and temple is destroyed, Cyrus comes along and God uses him as his servant to bring the people of Israel back, rebuild the temple, and reestablish uh, communication and union and relationship with God once again, that he uses even a foreign ruler to do it. So these are powerful words that start off with, we just love this passage as it begins, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. It's interesting because they start off with this word that says behold. You know, remember in the old King James Version it would say, lo, right? It would say something like, lo. And so that word, hain, in Hebrew is behold. In other words, it's kind of like when you have an unruly class or actually when it's 11 o'clock and I want to start service and I have to kind of go, okay, everybody, hello, look up here. That's what God is doing here. He says, behold, behold, stop what you're doing and pay attention because he says, you know what you're doing? All your eyes are on those idols. They're on all your enemies around you. And so you're full of fear. You're full of distractions. Your eyes are everywhere but where they should be. They need to be on my servant. Behold my servant. Look at my servant. And so if that's the case, then we really know it ain't you and me. Right? Then we know it probably ain't our nation. We know it has to be Jesus Christ. So if we want to fix our eyes, that's how I want to do it. There's four points I want to share with you here. There's four things. Remember the show, uh, The Lone Ranger? Anybody? How about the movie with Johnny Depp, which was a tragedy? But anyway. Um, but the old show, the old black and white show. Anybody old enough here to, remit, to admit it? There you go. Thank you very much. I'm old enough to admit it. So on my, uh, and so they would have the Lone Ranger, right, with Silver, right? I ho Silver away, and his buddy Tonto, right? So the old story goes, so uh, the Lone Ranger, and Lone Ranger was, a, was a, like a marshal. He was part of a group of rangers. It says Lone Ranger, which is almost an oxymoron, because he was still part of an association of a group of, of legal uh, law enforcers trying to bring law and the rule of law into a, into a chaotic West. But he had a buddy, Tonto, Native American, and so that was his friend, spoke in a horrible accent and all of that. And, uh, but one night, the story goes, they were sitting around a campfire out in the middle of nowhere, and along comes this band of Comanches, warriors, and they surround them, and they're coming in to threaten them. And so the Lone Ranger and Tonto stand up quickly, and they see the situation, and the Lone Ranger says, what are we going to do, Tonto? And Tonto says, what you mean we, Kimosabi? <laughs> right? At that moment, I'm guessing the Lone Ranger actually did feel alone. I think he probably felt pretty... Uh, alone, isolated. It is ir ironic though, isn't it? He's called the Lone Ranger, but his best buddy is probably his horse, and his, and his buddy is co his compatriot, uh, Tonto. So he wasn't really alone. And he was also part of an association of rangers. But we love the name, and we love the show. But he wasn't really alone. The first point that I want to share with you on this is that the servant is no Lone Ranger. The servant serves because he is upholding the will of God. Jesus says it many times, when I came, I upheld the will of the Father. I didn't act on my own. I act because I was fulfilling what God had in plan for his people. I came to serve, not to be served. And so he isn't a lone ranger, out on his own. But the tagline on here is important. 
The servant may be no lone ranger, but he may encounter very challenging times of loneliness. The only person who has ever been truly and completely and utterly alone ever in all of humanity was Jesus Christ on the cross. In that moment where he became sin, when he was rejected and separated from his Father, the Godhead that was one, that was a complete and perfect union, that's the moment where Jesus was alone. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so there are times when we experience loneliness, isolation, but that is almost always because we have imposed it on ourselves. Almost always because we have turned away from those who might embrace us. We did Greg Anderson's memorial yesterday and we're trying to continue to surround the family and Cheryl to make sure she doesn't feel alone. But you can be sure that there are times of great loneliness. When we experience loss like that, it sometimes doesn't matter how many people are around us, we can still feel as, as lonely as, as, we can, as we can possibly be. I was talking with Mike Sanders and I actually included a little bit of my message yesterday Something that Mike reminded me, because Mike lost his wife, his dear wife, and he said, I had to be reminded, he said, I had an epiphany, which means the light bulb came on. He said, I had an epiphany, and he said, I remembered that even when it's dark and I feel alone, the sun never stops shining. You know, you may get up in the middle of the night and it's 2 o'clock, and it is dark, pitch black, it looks pitch black out there. But let me ask you, is the sun still shining? And the answer is yes. We may have turned away or something may have gotten in the way, but the sun never stops shining. And so the servant is no lone ranger, serving the will of the Father, fulfilling his plans, but he may encounter times of great loneliness, just as we might. All of these apply first to Christ, but also to us as a servant. So, there may, so we are not called to be lone rangers. We're not called to go out there on our own. We're called to be as the body of Christ, to be his presence in this world, but we may encounter times of great loneliness. Amen? True? True enough. But we are not alone. The sun never stops shining. The second thing I want you to know, remember the movie Up? And uh, I don't know if you know that animated movie, Pixar movie, and it was a kind of a crusty old dude who lived in his house, lost his wife, and he was pestered constantly by a little Boy Scout dude. I don't know what they called him. Ranger Scout or something. Anyway, this Boy Scout comes along, and there's a dog, too. And so, finally, the, the house is lifted up by a great bunch of balloons, and they have a big adventure. And, uh, but the, what's interesting is uh, you got to love the dog, because the dog's name was Dog. Actually, Doug. But it's a neat play on the word dog. And so his, the dog's name is Doug. And he has a little voice box that allows you to hear what he's thinking, which with a dog ain't much. But he's all about his master, Right? He's all about loyalty, and he's all about his master. And so that dog, boy, he is focused. He is all about loving and being with his master. and he's Loyal and committed and absolutely, until all of a sudden, twirl. <laughs> right? And that's one of the cute, cute lines of the movie. You have this dog which is just passionately committed and single-minded, squirrel. <laughs> and, and, you know, the servant of the Lord, I love this in the passage as we look in Isaiah he will not falter or be discouraged, passionately committed to the mission of God. He is all about what God is calling him to do. He is all about walking there to fulfill the salvation for the world. But boy, can he get squirreled. Jesus Christ is constantly diverted. Not distracted. Diverted for grace's sake. And so while he may have the big picture, the salvation of the world, and this should be our mark too, easily, easily, easily diverted. That we should be easily diverted for the hurting, for the lonely, for the lost and the broken, for the person who is next to you desperately trying to hide their loss, desperately putting on a happy face, longing to try to pretend that everything is okay, and yet longing to have God's grace, His presence, His love in, in, their, in, their, in, their, in their life. And so I love this particular point, is that the servant has a clear sense of direction, absolutely committed, but is easily diverted. Is easily diverted for grace's sake. 
Grace is an interruption. Thank God. As Jesus walks resolutely to the cross, in three years' time, he is calling his disciples, he is teaching the word of God, and he is going to that cross and going to defeat death and have an empty tomb. That's what's going to happen for you and for me. But I'll tell you what, along the way, leper, prostitute, tax collector, stupid fisherman disciples, slow to believe and learn, arrogant uh, Pharisees, questioning seekers, Jesus is constantly and easily diverted for grace's sake. Thank God. He will always be diverted for you. And so should we. Third thing. Movie Schindler's List. You're familiar with that one? See it many years old now. Boy, it's a hard movie to watch. It's a good movie. It's a great movie. Important movie to watch. But it's about um, a Nazi uh, man who... Uh, was part of the party and everything, owned a big corporation, but secretly saved hundreds of uh, workers who were Jewish and to keep them from being executed in concentration camps. But there's a scene where there are Jews in the concentration camp and there's one of the Nazi guards just kind of indiscriminately likes to just shoot at people. Just shoot at people. If he hits one, eh, whatever. I just kind of scare him or hit him. And you know, when you're watching that, you're, you're, you're just angry and you're aching and you're saying, that is, there needs to be justice. We need justice. That guy, boy, in this movie, he better get it at the end. When I was up, Jim and I had the privilege of being, you know, Greg suffered that massive stroke, Greg Anderson, and so we were up at Ermac and going back and forth, tag teaming. And he just declined, you know, and the day that Greg passed, they called me and said, we think he's close, and I jumped in the car, and I got in there like a minute after he had passed away, just like a minute after, and we prayed and, and talked, and Cheryl was amazing, just a great deep well of faith, but her, her daughter-in-law, who spoke at the funeral, did a beautiful job yesterday, she, she just began saying, it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. Was she right? Yeah, she's right. She's right. It's not right for a minister to come in and say, oh, well, you know, he was a sinner and, you know, and we have a broken world. It's not fair. It is not God's desire that people suffer evil and hurt. It is not God's desire. But the world is busted pretty badly. If you don't think so, you ain't paying attention. The world is a pretty broken place. But it's not fair. And so we're, we are a people who demand a God of justice. The guy shooting people in the, in the street. We demand justice. But we are a people who need mercy. And that's what we have in the servant of the Lord. He will bring justice. How does he bring it? Not by getting his pound of flesh on someone else, but giving his whole body to the cross. By taking upon himself and in his life what was justly due us. People don't ever go to God and say, Lord, I just want what I deserve. I just want what's coming to me. I just want what's fair. If that's, our, if that's what we're asking for, be ready for a sad, sad realization. But rather to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I know my heart is demanding justice. And I am grateful that you have fulfilled it. But I need your mercy. And I long for your grace. That's the third point. We have a Savior, the servant is just, but he also shows mercy. I love this in the passage. A bruised reed he will not break. Isn't that great? A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Got any bruised reeds in the room? Smoldering wicks? Where it feels like you're on your last leg? One more gust of wind and I'm going to snap in half. One more gust of wind and I'm going to be extinguished. And he comes and surrounds us. Justice might be to let it happen. Mercy never lets it happen. And that's the Savior we have. Last thing. Fourth point. So the servant of the Lord. So, you know, in the memorial service, I tell people, I've told you this before, forgive me. How am I doing? Okay, sorry, I'll hurry. I started late. I apologize today. Um, but this is important. I've told you before, you know, pastors aren't experts on lots of things, but we're experts on two things, weddings and funerals. 
And so people often come in and say, oh, here's what we want to do. And you know, and you always have to be very gentle and very, very patient and cautious because you know the people are hurting or they're celebrating and they have in their mind, you know, a perfect wedding or this or that. And so you'll kind of say, hey, here's some thoughts. So every once in a while I'll have people say, well, we want to do, we want to give anybody in the room the opportunity to speak, you know, at the microphone. And I say, you know, very gently, I go, you know, there, there's probably going to be 400 people. That could really be something. Um, well, who do we say no to and how long does it go and, you know, what do we do? And you get what family just wants to honor the person, you know, they just want to give people a chance. And, uh, and then I have to tell them the story. One of the first memorials I ever did, we did that because I was a young pastor, didn't know any better. And I said, does anyone want to speak? And the ex-wife got up and the ex-wife got up and just laid into him and started dropping bad words in the church. And so, and I'm sitting there like paralyzed and the elders came and escorted her out. And at that point I said, no, we're not doing that anymore. So, but it was interesting, but the family still said, we'd like our immediate family that if they feel like they can say something, we'd like them to be able to do it. And I said, you bet. But I said, let me give you some counsel. I was with them Wednesday. I said, here's what I want you to think about. Winging it does not honor the person you're trying to honor. Preparing honors that person. And so I, I said, doing a little bit of homework and doing a little bit of work honors the person you're trying to honor. So I want to encourage you that if you're thinking about it and haven't decided, still prepare. Still prepare. This is the fourth point. The fourth point is this. The servant brings honor to the one that he serves. And so Jesus Christ, as the servant of the Lord, brings honor to the Lord God Almighty. From the foundations of the earth, this has been prepared. Generation upon generation, God has planned how to rescue and save his people, and he lives it out to perfection. But not only that, his preparation honors the ones he serves, and that is you and me, the servant of the Lord prepared and honored you and me. And that's our privilege, to give honor to the Lord who has first honored us with his love and his grace. To God be the glory. Amen.